The poems of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, are the oldest and best known works of Western literature. Most people who encounter them today encounter them in the form of books. They read them and study them as written documents, sometimes in fine textual detail. But the Homeric epics were originally oral poems. They weren't read as neatly packaged texts. They were listened to as they were performed live by trained bards known as Aoidoi and Rapsodoi. The bard would sing out the story in the form of long, stately lines of archaic Greek verse as he plucked his lyre as an accompaniment. Unfortunately, listening to a sung performance of Homer is an experience which most modern people will never have. The best that most of us can do is listen to scholarly reconstructions. Oral epic poems recounting the deeds of heroes are quite common in traditional societies around the world. They have certain recurring features. They're generally composed in stylized, archaic language. They are often performed by bards who accompany themselves on stringed instruments. And they're sometimes attributed to some legendary master poet. In all of these respects, the Iliad and the Odyssey are quite typical. They're not even all that long by cross-cultural standards, although in most societies it would be unusual for the whole of an epic to be performed in a single sitting. The Greek tradition of bardic singing, the tradition which culminated in Homer, goes back into the mists of time. It seems to have originated before Greek civilization itself took shape, and it was also influenced by the practices of neighbouring Middle Eastern societies. Homer himself tells us a bit about the tradition. Bardic singing seems to have been a recognised form of entertainment in his time. Homer depicts two bards at work in the Odyssey, Demodocus and Phemius, both of whom were attached to the courts of kings. We also learn something about bardic beliefs from Homer. It seems that the bard presented himself as the instrument of the muses, the goddesses of artistic inspiration. He was a kind of vessel for the divine. This model of the singer's role explains why Homer's narrative has a distinctively impersonal, objective tone. He is no more and no less than the mouthpiece of the gods. It's been known for quite a long time that the Homeric poems grew out of an oral tradition. In the 18th and 19th centuries, European scholars compared them to the folk songs that formed part of peasant culture in their own societies. Yet it was only in the 1920s that the epic's character as oral texts was demonstrated in detail. This was due to the work of an American scholar called Milman Parry. Parry concentrated on the repeated formulaic lines and phrases that recur in Homer's verse, Wily Odysseus and When Early Born Rosy Fingered Dawn Appeared are perhaps the best known. Formulas of this kind are a telltale sign of oral origins. Parry made two field trips to Yugoslavia in 1933-35 to study that country's living tradition of oral poetry. He even met a kind of Bosnian Serb version of Homer, a singer called Avjo Majedovic, who obligingly sang a couple of his own epics for the American stranger. <laughs> One interesting insight that came out of Parry's work was that bards in traditional oral cultures don't memorise their material word for word, so no two performances of a single epic type song are the same. The singers just follow the same general plotline and construct their verses off the cuff, using the traditional stock of formulaic phrases, but without aiming for word for word accuracy. This is referred to in the scholarly literature as composition in performance. And incidentally, this is where the analogy with short folk songs breaks down. They do tend to be memorised and repeated more or less word for word. The process includes the influence of the listeners on the bard. 
His work product will differ depending on what kind of audience he has. Clues within the poems suggest that the Iliad and the Odyssey were first reduced to writing at some point in or around the 600s BC, although scholars used to prefer a dating in the 700s. Quite how this happened is still unclear. It's unlikely that there was a single genius who was responsible for composing both epics. The figure of Homer is probably a legendary creation. The name seems to have been taken from the Homeridae, a clan of bards. Nevertheless, two individual poets may well have taken the lead in compiling each of the two works, even though they were standing on the shoulders of a much older bardic tradition. It's sometimes suggested that the epic's monumental scale means that they must have been produced under aristocratic patronage. Only wealthy men, it's said, would have had the resources and the motivation to commission bards to compose and dictate works which are tens of thousands of lines long. But this theory sits uneasily with the fact that the poems are not propaganda for established conservative values. The Iliad in particular is a text in a tragic vein, which shows clear signs of disliking the gods, war and social hierarchy. The evidence of ancient scraps of papyrus shows that the texts of the Iliad and the Odyssey were still to some extent fluid in ancient times. They only settled down into something like the fixed forms we have today, in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BC, under the influence of scholars in Alexandria in Egypt. In later times, epic poetry became the domain of literate scholar-poets like Virgil and Apollonius of Rhodes, and indeed Dante and John Milton. Literate writers of epic retained some of the old conventions, the odd formulaic phrase, and the pretense that they were singing under the inspiration of the muses. But by this time, such conventions were just that, conventions. By contrast, the world of Homer was not one of literary craftsmanship and learned wordplay. It was the world not of the common room, but of the campfire.